This presentation of the Gothic period brings together all the pieces of the puzzle that we've been talking about since Constantine's basilicas were used as the prototypical church. God is Light is pushed to its penultimate expression of stone construction in the great cathedrals of the Ile de France, culminating in the tallest church interior, even today, in the Cathedral of St. Peter in Beauvais, France. However, a small jewel box of a Gothic chapel, La Saint-Chapelle, built by King Philip IX to claim his ascendancy to the French throne and to display his recently purchased relics from the emperor in Constantinople, culminates the high Gothic period with its display of perhaps the most beautiful stained glass windows ever constructed. See what you think. The end times is what people during the medieval period in the early Gothic and late Renaissance called that period of time. They were waiting for the millennial and, and they thought they were in the end times. And then after the millennial, building the larger churches began again in earnest. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight with the theme that we finished up last week with Saint-Denis, which was the first Gothic cathedral. And that was all about, I think, a lot of verses from, from John and First John about God is light. And they really were trying to create these transcendent spaces. I'm going to go through a few of uh, what became what I call, called the last time I did this presentation, a race to the heavens. And this was in the primarily the Ile-de-France area around Paris, where they kept pushing each other and going higher and higher and higher. And so you kind of have to keep in mind the uh, structural principles that we've been talking about the last few weeks, outward springing forces of the vaults and arches and, and domes. And, uh, and you'll see that the, these buildings are, are uh, really force diagrams, force structures to control those forces to create a very unusual New Jerusalem transit in heaven on earth space for, for worshipers. And these are some of the buildings we'll talk about tonight. Paris is at the center. We talked about Saint-Denis, Saint-Denis here. And then uh, we're going to start over here in Léon and I think go to Amiens, Chartres, and Beauvais. I think I dropped Bourges out. So let's, you'll have an idea where all these cathedrals are. I'm not going to be talking about uh, English Gothic. It took on a different character. My lineage here that I'm talking about is this structural issues and how they overcame certain things to create these great, great buildings. And that happened primarily in France. English became more ornamental. This is a drawing of four elevations inside the naves of churches going from left to right in chronological order. The one on the left is Léon, Notre Dame Paris, is B, C is Chartres, and D is Amiens. And you can see from the difference in Léon on the left and Amiens on the right, I wanted to point out a couple of things. For example, in Chartres, you'll see that, it, that we're still using the basilica form. We have the side aisle, we have the triforium, and we have the clear story. Now, look how large the clear story opening is. So we they fill that with stained glass, and it does let a lot of mystical light in. In one part of Notre Dame, they tried a double triforium, and then they gave it up. This is at the corner of the transept in the nave in Notre Dame in Paris. When they open it up again, you can look for it. They put in a sign of a rose window, but it's side aisle, triforium, triforium, clear story in Lyon. It was side aisle, triforium, triforium and clear story. I don't know why they did that, but just to keep you aware of that, so next time you travel, you might be aware of that and take a look and see how it looks. I think they gave up this double triforium because it created some awkward uh, proportional spaces. Like that clear story just doesn't cut it compared to something like that or that. Okay, so let's go to Leon. It was built in 1160. Here's an aerial photograph. So what happens is, and I want to bring this to your attention, that the apse end of these cathedrals 
We're supposed to face east or more specifically towards Jerusalem. I did a slide of that last week, I think. And here's a situation where the absent of Leon, which is here, faces east. This is north is, is up. And then this drawing, and I take this with a grain of salt, but this is evidently an original, I mean, a copy of an original drawing they found on vellum. And it shows an ordering system based on the golden means that I briefly spoke about last week and we'll talk about next week more so in the Renaissance. But you'll see a lot of this sort of geometry is applied to facades, both in Gothic and Renaissance buildings as controlling principles. And I've seen it overlaid on the Mona Lisa and other places that it draws suspicion to my mind whether it was the, some of this is really um, controlled by what, what the authors are, are saying. So this is an original drawing and the building seems to be proportioned according to the golden means. Here's the plan of the cathedral. This piece back here was added after the fact. You can see the old chevet here, uh, the rounded apse in, and the double triforium, the nave arcade, the clear story. And this is what's called a sexpartite vault. One vault is divided into six parts, and that's where the ribbing crosses two bays. So you get the sexpartite partitioning but the problem with it is it's very, very heavy compared to the later quadripartite vaulting. And I'll be pointing these out as we go along. So this is part of the older, the original vaulting for the ceilings. And that what that does is create where the diagonals are, a column, let's call it B, and then the transverse arch creates a different column, A. So you can see there's like three responds, those colonnettes here, and there's five here. So you get this rhythm as you go down the nave from A, B, A, B, A, B. In this case, as I said earlier, there's a lower triforium and an upper triforium, the clear story above it. Let's go to probably the most famous, and that's Notre Dame de, de Paris on the Ile de la Cité. It's right here, this uh, aerial photo was taken before the fire, I wanted to show you a couple of things about this particular building and how it's sited. The apse faces Jerusalem, which is what it's supposed to do. And by the way, if you're ever here again visiting, walk through this garden and walk through this hedge right about here. And this will take you to the Memorial de Martyrs de la Deportation in the it's, it's a martyr to the 20,000 Parisian Jews that were exterminated in the Holocaust. Very moving. Notre Dame, the classic view of it, the west facade. And keep in mind that this building was in bad repair. It was heavily, not destroyed, but beaten up by the French revolutionaries. And what you see when you look at this building, particularly some of these, these chimera and gargoyles, they are a 19th century interpretation of Gothic. They're not necessarily the real deal. And this is where the crown of thorns is kept in the treasury there. And that was one of the major concerns that this was moved to safety during that fire. And this is what the plan looks like. It's a five aisle cathedral. You can see one, two, three, the nave, four, five. And what they did is these are the buttresses coming down, the flying buttresses where they engage the town. And then it looks like to me, they filled in with glass and stone to make these chapels off of the uh, outer aisle. And, and you can see what the purpose of that is. You can have worshiping going on in the nave and the choir and pilgrims can come and walk along the ambulatory and pay homage to relics or or saints or whoever is in that, that particular chapel. And there's the cruciform. And this is what the, the ceiling looks like. And if you can pick it out, you'll see the diagonal going across two bays. 
and then the transverse arch. So between these two transverse arches, you'll get six partitions. So Notre Dame is one of the older Gothic cathedrals with the heavier six partite vaulting. This is the nave, this is the choir. So this piece right here is this, and this piece right here is this. You can see the apse beyond the altar. Here's the altar, okay. And then we go outside and it looks like it's a pretty complicated building, but in fact, if you remember from last week, it's just really the same thing repeated over and over and over again, but it, it uh, wraps around the end, these flying buttresses and pinnacles, they all just kind of merge into this kind of gauzy, complicated looking building. The emphasis I want to make to you is this stuff out here all is in support, the pointed arches, the flying buttresses, inside the rib vaulting, that's all in support of the interior. The interior is clean, it's designed to be transient. And out here is, it's not ugly. Well, the Italians started to make fun of it in the Renaissance, but it's quite a remarkable thing to see these and realize that this is, think of it maybe as an exoskeleton, if you would. Oh, in the, the west facade, uh, this end faces Jerusalem, the other end faces the plaza in, in Paris. This is called the Trinity portal. There is a center to the nave, and then these two doors go to the two side aisles on either side. And this is what it looks like at sunset. I took this photograph when I was visiting Shakespeare and Company's famous bookstore. And there's a park across the street, and so the setting sun gives us a beautiful golden color. I apologize, some of this might seem like Ron's travels in Paris or France or something, but I hope it's more substantial than that. And obviously, this is before the, the fire. You can see the sculptures there, the spire, and so forth. And just a block further it is really cool little uh, bar and restaurant. Okay, now to my favorite building, uh, and this isn't necessarily Ron's tour of France, but this I think is one of the best buildings ever built by man. It's the Notre Dame de Chartres, built in 1194. And what I love about this painting that was done in 1885 is it gives you a sense of what Chartres was like. Even today, if you drive just out of Paris, you'll see this building rise up out of the plain in the distance. And it looks about that large compared to everything around it. And what I like about this is, you know, this is what it may have looked like in the day, you know, the little village houses and sheep and so forth. It wasn't, and then you see this thing popping out of the landscape. It's like, oh my goodness, what is this? And uh, how Chartres kind of got started, I think there was churches here off and on from about the time of Charlemagne, maybe even a little bit before. This here is Chartres, what it may have looked like in 1032. You can see the basilica form from the side. This is the side aisle. There's probably a triforium here and then the clear story here. But what happened is the tunic of Mary is said to have been given to the church in 876, was thought to have been destroyed in a fire in 1194. Three days later, it was found unharmed in the treasury, which the bishop claimed was a sign from Virgin Mary herself that another more magnificent cathedral should be built in its place. Okay, so this is what Chartres looks like, one of the, the best of the best. And you notice this roof is green. All the other Gothic cathedral roofs are gray, and that's because this roof was rebuilt in the 18th century using copper sheets rather than the normal lead sheets. And the reason is this building went through the similar fire that Notre Dame did recently, but I don't understand why they didn't do this in Notre Dame. And they took off the old roof and they framed it in this newfangled thing called cast iron construction that Scottish were leading away with with cast iron bridge construction, and they adapted that to roof framing here. All the interior is without timber, 
and the roof is covered with copper sheets. You go there, you take a look at it, you'll see that it is a little bit different, and I think it makes a lot more sense. They don't have to worry about the roof burning down again like they're going to have to do in Paris again because of using timbers. Okay, Chartres Cathedral, its apse faces northeast. It would be more correctly placed if they turned it about 90 degrees clockwise, but there you have it. It's, it still does face easterly. People ask, well, why are these two towers different? And there was a, an attempt at symmetry in Gothic architecture. Now, here's the center line. And what was on the right was they wanted to match on the left, just like they did later in the Renaissance. But this was two different periods, and most likely they would have not had the money to tear this down and, and build another one. But, but I think it looks just fine the way it is. Inside, which is what it's all about, is we have now a quadripartite vault. You'll see the crossing goes across one bay and then a transverse arch, transverse arch. And so you get one, two, three, four segments to the vault. And it made it easier for them to construct because this vault was lighter than the six part vault. If you start here, let's say, and you're building this way, remember that these vaults are springing out. And they had to figure out a way as they were building this and it got heavier and heavier to keep uh, to keep pushing back from this side before they got this fall constructed. And then when they got to the end and they built this massive piece of the West facade to kind of act as a bookend to keep all this from pushing out this way. And the same with the, the massive uh, North and South portals here to keep these uh, transept vaults from pushing out. Quadripartite vaulting, we get just a simple A, 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 A rhythm. All the columns are pretty much the same going down the nave and across the transept. From the outside, you can see the side aisle and the clear story. Here is the inside. Give me an idea of how vast this space is. There's two little scale, human scale figures, but we have the same basilica form from the third century where we have the side aisle, the triforium, and the clear story up here. And then this is that cast iron frame roof that I was talking about. What's interesting here is if you look at this section, there's a vault here. This, this piece of vault here, it's a ribbing of the vault. And then this is the webbing up here. And here is the spring line. But what happens is line buttresses go into step buttressing to take the forces going down through here all the way to the ground. This is a photograph of, you can see here's the, the nave and the transept, the rose windows, the three rose windows. And then these are the stained glass windows at the side aisle, the clear story, and then the transept and then around the top of the chevet and the bottom of the chevet. And you'll notice here that there's a couple of, they're gray glass. And when we get to the next couple of cathedrals, you'll see where this gray is used to replace blown out windows from the bombing in the First World War. But I was surprised to find out that they actually use gray in certain areas to tone the light to where they wanted it to, to either be more light or less light for the effect on the interior. So there was some pretty sophisticated fine tuning of that transcendent experience that they were after. And this is what it looks like. It's just a, it, it, it's, it's a whole nother world. I hope you all get a chance to, to go here. I mean, just look at this. I mean, how many pieces of stained glass are in here? I think there's a 2,000 square meters of stained glass here. And then one little side issue is on the facade, you'll see these saints, or these are Old Testament prophets, and they are given a place in the facade by giving them an edicula to stand under. So they're on this little pedestal with this little house above them. 
and those are called edicula. And you'll see those uh, quite frequently. They give a statue a place to be. When I was in Barcelona, the new Sagrada Familia, which is supposed to be finished in the next decade or so, I remember seeing several edicula without statues. And what that tells me is the, that the statues will be coming later to, to occupy that space, just so you've heard about it. This is the most famous of the labyrinths. You can find a local version uh, painted in the parish hall at St. Andrews in Glenwood. And they also have a labyrinth, I believe, at Claggett Center. If you stand on the back deck, you can see sometimes people using this. It's designed for contemplative prayer. And the difference between a labyrinth and a maze is there's no false turns in a labyrinth. Once you start on the labyrinth, you have to go through the whole thing. You don't have to, but uh, there's no like dead ends. You know, the whole thing is one continuous flow until you get to the middle and then you go back out again. And it's 42 feet in diameter. If you follow the entire pathways, it's 964 feet or 293.8 meters. And it has attracted pilgrims to Chartres for 900 years. And you can walk the labyrinth any Friday from 10 to five, from Lent to All Saints Day. And a lot of people come and do that. Okay, so this is what the, the labyrinth looks like from, from the vaulting. You can see they pushed all the chairs out of the way. And then after Lent, they, they'll pull the chairs back out. You won't be able to see this as clearly. Here's a nighttime view of it. This is where the labyrinth occupies the nave, the altars down here. And here's some pilgrim using it. And you can see this person has made it to the center and is sitting in contemplation. And evidently there's a etiquette to doing this. I haven't done it, but I'm not sure how you pass people or whatever, or give way. But a lot of people that have done it say they recommend doing it. And here's a larger group doing it as well. And this is, I think, a beautiful candlelit. The labyrinth is candlelit at the altars at the top of the photograph. And what I wanted to say about this is the transformative ability of art, architecture, music, and poetry. Transcendence is the hope for meaning that we cannot otherwise have. And spirituality is our capacity for a relationship to that meaning, the mind of God. That's what this cathedral and the rest of them are about. And so that is Notre Dame. And they've hiked 121 feet built in 1194. I mean, Notre Dame de Chartres. More importantly from the history of France is Notre Dame de Reims. Um, it's a place of coronation of the French kings since the sixth century. And Napoleon was crowned emperor here. So it's a long history. This is a painting of Louis XIV's coronation, and it received a lot of damage during the First World War. I just can't imagine these beautiful buildings. Just You can see just, you know, beautifully carved pieces uh, just smashed to the ground. It's awful. And the whole town was taken apart like that. You see here. I mean, yeah, that whole thing is missing there at the West End, a whole bit, couple of bays. But anyway, they rebuilt it. It faces northeast. The nave height here is four feet higher than Chartres. And the west facade looks a lot like Léon. But you'll notice that there is a window instead of the, I forgot to point out the tympanum above most doorways, they usually have Christ in judgment in sculpture, in bas-relief sculpture there. This one has a very, very deep portal. Christ in judgment sits up here, and this is uh, more stained glass. You can see that very deep portal with all the, um, the prophets and saints and Christ. You can see the main doors here from the outside. This is from the inside. There's that beautiful window above. And the same view looking down the nave.
but you can see these windows here, a lot of these windows are gray glass because they were literally blown out and they just couldn't replace, they couldn't duplicate the glass or the, or the, or the uh, configuration of them. France is the place of the coronation of French kings. Here is Saint Remy, uh, Clovis was baptized, the king of the Franks, and here he is getting baptized. And that's the Holy Spirit, which I thought was a dove. I look at it closely, it looks more like a duck to me, but I don't want to be disrespectful. But anyway, that's Clovis being baptized Christmas Day of 508, right here before the cathedral, but when it was a, small, a smaller building. And you can see it's a three aisle cathedral. And then at, at the transept, it becomes a five aisle cathedral but that one aisle is, they, they really, these were all pilgrims churches. They all emphasize circulation and chapels and relics, places for relics to be observed. And there's that beautiful deep portal with the, the window. And then I always thought of angels as being feminine. And I always thought that she was smiling at me. She's a very angel called the smiling angel. Turns out it's neither a him or a her smiling at me, but she has a, uh, the angel has a beautiful smile and she, she's on the facade there as well. And I wanted to also show you this column of sculpture on the facade. They're all decapitated and this is the result of the French Revolution. It's unfortunate. A lot of these cathedrals became, instead of Notre Dame of so-and-so town, they were the Cathedral of Reason knowledge. And so this is what France looks like today, rebuilt from the bombings of the First World War. And now to Amiens, um, we're, we're just kind of going around Paris. Amiens is the tallest complete Gothic cathedral. The nave is 139 feet high, it's built in 1220. And you can see here that it's correctly aligned with the apse pointing towards Jerusalem. And this is what it looks like. It is quite a formidable piece of, of stone. The west facade, and it has the tympanum back in the traditional place. You can see it here. This is usually, uh, in most of these cathedrals, it's Christ in judgment with saints and prophets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, arches and of flanking the door jams. And this is what they did during the First World War to try to save it. You can see this pile of sandbags. There's some people at the front door. They put some wood beams across and, and just piled up to, to try to save the glass the best they could. And you can see the chairs for worship here, and they just really filled this with sandbags to keep it from collapsing. And again, these are these 20th century Grisset windows. You can see all this gray glass. Here's some stained glass, but most of this is gray glass. So it loses a lot of its transcendence effect. The Chevet is, is shown here. And what we have is quadripartite vaulting. You can see the one, two, three, four parts. And this piece right here is the top of the choir and the apse is beyond. And they also have a labyrinth here. It's, I don't think it's as famous as Chartres, but here it is in the cathedral. Uh, but it, it's not a maze, it's a labyrinth with, with contem, for, for contemplation. And the center of this labyrinth is carved icons to help with the prayer process and contemplative process right there. Well, Notre Dame de Amiens was the tallest complete Gothic cathedral, meaning that it has choir, the apse, the transept, the nave, the side aisles. It's complete, it has a west front, it has a north portal and a south portal. So it's a complete cathedral, but it's not the tallest but it's the tallest complete one at 139 feet. And you could tell that they were into some trouble because they have cracking 
in the Triforium here, that's not a good sign. Stones cracking. I didn't mean to talk about the misplaced buttresses at Chartres. This is where I wanted to talk about it. You can see it in this kind of blue-green is pointing to the original buttressing. And then the red is new buttressing added to help control this cracking that was starting to appear throughout the cathedral. Again, it, the blue-green, the original buttresses, and then new buttresses added. And let me see if I can pick something out here. Yeah, the spring lines down here, you'll notice, and they have the, butter, the, the original buttresses up here. And so on the other side, I think they did it on both sides, here is a new buttress that hits the spring line in an, in an appropriate location. This was too high. So they ended up with cracking. They had to come back and repair it. You can see the, the cracks here. Spring line, the original flying buttress, and the new buttresses to pick up the outward thrust. And this is what it looks like inside. It's quite beautiful. It's a fisheye view of the nave and the transept crossing. The west is at the bottom. The altar is at beyond the top of the photograph. And this is also, I think, interesting. Someone a few years ago, they did a polychromatic light projection depicting the original appearance of the west portal. And if this is correct, you can see that this was quite a colorful place. It wasn't the usual gray stone that we were used to seeing up in here in, in Christ in Judgment, that these colors meant something in terms of who was who in the place in Christendom. Okay, the last one, the last full cathedral, well, this isn't a full cathedral. It's St. Peter de Beauvais in France, and I call it a cathedral too tall. The nave height jumps to 156 feet. That is really high. But here's the apse end of it and the south portal. And here is what it looks like. You can see the arms of the transept. You can see the choir. And that's it. it uh, they didn't build any more of it. This is actually an old Romanesque church that didn't get torn down because they couldn't go further. And I'll show you what happened. It's interesting. The nave and side aisles are missing. That's unusual. But what they started out with, you start at the, at the east end and you build from east to west. And so they started back here and they went up 156 feet. They started with the newer quadripartite vault, which is lighter in weight, and they had a column rhythm of A, A, A going down the choir. And so you can see what was happening is that they were getting structural failures. So let me see what I can show you. So what they did was, if you look here, they, they had an intermediate columns and vaulting in. So you get the, the old A, B, A, B, A, B rhythm in the choir. And now you have six partite vaulting, which allows you to span two bays. And, and so essentially, when they had this old A to A spacing, that was like having a beam too long and too thin. The best way to reduce the force on a beam between two walls or two columns is to introduce another column in between to shorten the span. And that's basically what they did. And so you're looking at one of the newer cathedrals back with the old uh, sex partite vaulting, but that was to save the cathedral because it was going to come down. And that had to be a, a frightening thought. And you can see the ABAB -A -B rhythm in the choir here and the one, two, three, four, five, six sex partite vault. This is Beauvais after the World War I bombing. There's not much left of it to be honest, and it was rebuilt. And I want you to notice, if you look at this, the French never would use tie rods in the interior of their building. They wouldn't use them in the exterior of their building. Italians did, but the French here ended up using tie rods. You can see them here. This is after the fact. 
You can see another, some more here. And that was because the stone, these arches, which were designed for compression, were getting tensile forces in them. And I think it was because they were so tall, they, they were acting like a sail in the wind. And they were getting a lot of push back and forth in heavy winds, and it was causing cracking. So they tried to tie it all together with these, with these tie rods. I'll show you a little bit more about that uh, <clears throat> in a second. And here's a, a detail of all these tie rods to keep this. This is the tallest of, of, uh, of any church in the world. It's the tallest of the Gothic cathedrals. Keep in mind, this was built uh, 800 years ago. What they did inside, they had to do. And that is they put these wood trusses in. You can see them all over the place to keep these columns from buckling. If you remember a few weeks ago, a little talk on columns crushing and columns buckling. And when columns were too thin and you put a lot of weight on them, instead of crushing, they would kick out. You know, they would, they would do this, you know, buckle out. And so that's what was happening here. And you can see here what they're doing is they're picking up the spring line of these arches, or they're also trying to keep these from uh, kicking out and buckling. Not very attractive, but I'll give them credit for one thing. They did a beautiful job of taking the choir and the crossing, and they didn't put anything inside here. This is, the Italians would have put, they would have looked at it differently, and they would have put tie rods across, but the French wouldn't do that. Uh, so this is modern trussing, or relatively modern. You can see it here also, but they did keep this clean. So if you go in here, you can really experience the beauty of this massive choir. Here's the wood bracing, wood bracing. Okay, so this is St. Peter de Beauvais, a cathedral too tall, beautiful watercolor rendering of the apse and the transept and the crossing. You can see the, uh, these massive, massive flying buttresses and buttresses that go down. And our old friend had her out before the Statue of Liberty. The top of her torch is 151 feet from the ground, and she will fit inside here because this with four feet to spare. Pretty amazing. When they, you know, you think of the Middle Ages, you know, these guys were were ignorant and they were ignorant about a lot of things that we know better now due to science, but boy, could they build. And then most favorite place inside to be is in La Sainte-Chapelle. We looked at the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris right here. La Sainte-Chapelle is on the Ile de la Cité also, and it sits right here. And it is just a single space chapel with a crypt below and the apse in points to Jerusalem like it's supposed to. Interesting about this is Louis the Ninth. he wanted to, he, he was making a claim for the throne, so he wanted to do something that the people would honor him as their, their king. He acquired 22 relics from the emperor of Constantinople in 1241. He built La Sainte-Chapelle to house the relics. La Sainte-Chapelle was built to look like a large reliquary, and I'll show you that in a minute. Three relics remain, one, a fragment of the cross, two, a nail, one nail, and three, the crown of thorns. What happened to the rest of the stuff is after the French Revolution, they came in and, and just threw all that stuff out. They threw the, the nails in a field or something. They, they found one nail, but the other two have never been recovered. Somehow the crown of thorns was saved. And to give you an idea of this beautiful building, the construction of La Sainte-Chapelle cost one third of what Louis, Louis IX paid for the crown of thorns. So the crown of thorns cost three times what he paid for this building, about half the annual income of his royal domain. And there are 6,652 square feet of stained glass in here. This is a drawing of Louis the Ninth right here, receiving the crown of thorns, the three nails, and the wood cross from, the, from Constantinople. 
I'll leave it to your faith or belief whether these are the true relics or not, or was this conjured up to make money because Constantinople was looking for money at the time. That's why they decided to sell this, sell off your assets. Crown of thorns, the three nails, and the true cross. And this is what it looks like. Here's a reliquy. You know, it has sides to it and it has a sloping top and usually some sort of decorative crown along the ridge, so to speak. And you see the same sort of thing here. Here's La Saint Chapelle in the exterior. It's designed to look like a reliquy and it has a fire at the center, but it's, it's, it's built in a very compact place. So they couldn't put flying buttresses on here, but it's a pretty tall building pretty tall interior space. This is later Gothic now. This is built in 1246. You can see it rise up above the city of Paris in this drawing from the medieval times. So here's a plan of the crypt, the bookshops right here. You see it over here or the gift shop. And um, you'll notice that there's two very obscure uh, stairs. This one goes up where people go up, and this one is where people come back down, and then you leave through these doors. You see the doors open here. Look at the thickness of the walls down here in the crypt, and look how thin the walls are up here. You can see these are engaged buttresses. They're not flying buttresses, and I'll show you what they did in a minute to overcome that, but this is all thin glass all the way around it. You know, you walk up into here, and it's called the Bible of Light, because all of these panels are Bible stories, and it just, the first time I walked in here, I, my jaw dropped, and I could not believe it. I've been back many times. I uh, haven't been back in, in five years, because now it seems to have made all the guidebooks. Um, I'm not going to say, unfortunately, I'm, but I'm glad other people had a chance to experience its beauty. This is a bit of the the Bible stories, this is how it works. These are the panels, 1 through 16. Number 1 here starts out with creation, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Judges, uh, the Passion of Christ is dead center. That's number 8 right here, and so forth and around. As you go up these panels, uh, that tells you the story of each individual book of the Bible. And this is what the vaulting looks like upstairs. Here's the rose window. You'll notice that these are kind of flame-like mullions now. It's typical of the late Gothic, later Gothic, the flamboyant period where they really started getting fancy with their, their uh, stone carving. But this is the whole place right here. And it's this beautiful purple-blue uh, stained glass. During the Second War, they took all of it out and stored it in hiding. The Bible in light, give you an idea of, of what it looks like inside. And this is how they did it. We the, Here's the vault. Here's the spring line. Here's an, uh, a continuous engaged buttress, but it doesn't touch the glass. And here's the chapel level. So that's the chapel volume. Here's the crypt volume. And then the engaged buttresses, you see them on the upper level and in the crypt. And what they did, because they couldn't put flying buttresses out, you know, in other words, they couldn't put a flying buttress out here and come down. They just didn't have the room, is they made these iron reinforcing links. So one end was a, a hole, the other end was a hook, and they hooked them together. And what they did was you can see at the vault level, up in the ceiling, they were hidden in the vaulting, and they used these iron links to hold the vaulting together from side to side. And then because of the spring line, which is here, and the buckling of these tall, thin columns, which is here, they wrapped this with these iron links. And these are, I'm going to go back just a second. I want you to see this uh, da, da, da. here. If you look across here, this is those iron links. You can see it in the stained glass going along here. That is for the catch the, the spring of the vaulting. And here for the buckling of the columns, you can see this is the other band of those links. And I highlighted them yellow, but I forgot to take, take it so that they disappear. 
I apologize, but but anyway, so they they use tension to, instead of compression to keep this thing from falling apart. This is the comparative section through the nave. You can see how they starting at Lyon and then working their way up all the way to Beauvais, built higher and higher and higher. Then I thought for your information that the National Cathedral, the nave is 102 feet high. It's the 56th tallest church in the world. St. Paul's London, 22nd tallest uh, at 123 feet. Sagrada Familia Barcelona is tied for third place at 148 feet. And St. Peter's Rome is number two at 151 feet. And this was, what, 156 or five or something like that at Beauvais. So it, built in 1220, remains the tallest uh, church in the world. And so just a comparison of all the beautiful vaulting that we've seen. And so the Gothic, here's Beauvais, the apse end and the south portal, and then some interior of the stained glass and the dematerialization of the stone columns and walls. That to me, Gothic appears gauzy. It's not sharp edged and precise. It's ephemeral, it's complex, and it's intended to be mystical. It's designed for the spirit world. That's what these people believed. That was their life. The church was their life. It was their protector. They believed in a spirit world. And interestingly enough, is the structural forces that these cathedrals overcame provided major symbols for later Christian churches. And we have two at St. Mark's. We have step buttresses and we have pointed arches in the windows. None of them are structural, but they came from these buildings and became symbols of Christianity. And those symbols were based on uh, overcoming structural problems. The design is based on a geometry as opposed to mathematics. That's not entirely true, but mostly so. They worked out these designs, drawing them on the ground or on vellum or literally in the dirt. They use chalk or charcoal on floors. Uh, they know that as well. And it was designed to create heaven on earth, a new Jerusalem. Saints and their relics became important in worshipers' lives. Remember the pilgrimages. That's what people went to these different places to be close to the relics of these saints because the saints were holy and they were very important in the lives of these, in, in the belief and worship of these believers. And last but not least is God is light. That's really what all this is about. And you can see down here uh, the way they handled it was uh, incredible. When you go into these cathedrals, they, they're overlit for the most part because tourists want to see um, and people don't want to be stumbling over steps that appear in an aisle or something like that. I really would like to go in one of these churches uh, with just candles and torches on. It'd be pretty, uh, pretty amazing experience. So next is going to be the Renaissance and the Babylonian captivity. In this little drawing, Rome is a widow in mourning, dressed in black. There was an animosity uh, bubbling and, and getting stronger and stronger between the Italians and the French. And when I say Italians, I'm talking about the occupants of the Italian peninsula, because Italy wasn't a state at this time. Then the French, with the Babylonian captivity in, from 1309 to 1376, the Pope was moved to Avignon, the south of France. And... It has major, major repercussions. This animosity, for example, the Italians coined the phrase Gothic. At the beginning of this talk, I talked about the end times and God is light. Again, the end times were what they called this period during the period. The Italians, after the fact, called it Gothic, meaning it was a pejorative term that said these buildings were ugly, and they really disliked what the French had done to the beauty of, of their Roman buildings and reinterpreting them. Like I said, though, the French were interested on the inside of the building and let the external forces express themselves with flying buttresses and pointed arches and, and engaged buttresses and so forth. So next time, we're going to look at a sharp turn in the way man looked at himself and religion. It continues to change. The French 
Roman animosity continues to build during the Babylonian captivity, and with it comes the reclamation of the church power by the Pope in Rome. Roman and Hellenistic architecture and culture now come to the Western Christian forefront with the demolition of old St. Peter's and the construction of new St. Peter's in Rome. Renaissance is a massive case of out with the old and in with the new. I might add, for better or for worse.